Chapter Twelve of the Kabbalion by the Three Initiates. Recording by Andrea Fiore. Chapter Twelve Causation. Every cause has its effect, every effect has its cause. Everything happens according to law. Chance is but a name for law not recognized. There are many planes of causation, but nothing escapes the law. The Kabbalion. The great sixth hermetic principle, the principle of cause and effect, embodies the truth that law pervades the universe, that nothing happens by chance, that chance is merely a term indicating cause existing but not recognized or perceived, that phenomena is continuous, without break or exception. The principle of cause and effect underlies all scientific thought, ancient and modern, and was enunciated by the hermetic teachers in the earliest days. While many and varied disputes between the many schools of thought have since arisen, these disputes have been principally upon the details of the operations of the principle, and still more often upon the meaning of certain words. The underlying principle of cause and effect has been accepted as correct by practically all the thinkers of the world worthy of the name. To think otherwise, would be to take the phenomena of the universe from the domain of law and order and to regulate it to control the imaginary something which men have called chance a little consideration will show any one that there really is in reality no such thing as pure chance webster defines the word chance as follows a supposed agent or mode of activity other than a force law or purpose the operation or activity of such agent the supposed effect of such agent a happening fortuity casualty etc but a little consideration will show you that there can be no such agent as chance in the sense of something outside of law something outside of cause and effect how could there be something acting in the phenomenal universe independent of the laws order and continuity of the latter such a something would be entirely independent of the orderly trend of the universe and therefore superior to it we can imagine nothing outside of the all being outside of the law and that only because the all is the law itself there is no room in the universe for something outside of and independent of law the existence of such a something would render all natural laws ineffective and would plunge the universe into chaotic disorder and lawlessness a careful examination will show that what we call chance is merely an expression relating to obscure causes causes we cannot perceive causes that we cannot understand the word chance is derived from a word meaning to fall as the falling of dice the idea being that the fall of the dice and many other happenings are merely a happening unrelated to any cause, and this is in the sense in which the term is generally employed. But when the matter is closely examined, it is seen that there is no chance whatsoever about the fall of the dice. Each time a die falls and displays a certain number, it obeys a law as infallible as that which governs the revolution of the planets around the sun. Back of the fall of the die are causes or chains of causes running back further than the mind can follow the position of the die in the box the amount of muscular energy expended in the throw the condition of the table etc etc all are causes the effect of which may be seen but back of these seen causes there are chains of unseen preceding causes all of which had a bearing upon the number of the die which fell uppermost if a die be cast a great number of times it will be found that the numbers shown will all be about equal that is there will be an equal number of one spot two spot etc coming uppermost toss a penny in the air and it may come down either heads or tails but make a sufficient number of tosses and the heads and tails will about even up this is the operation of the law of average but both the average and the single toss come under the law of cause and effect and if we were able to examine into the preceding causes it would be clearly seen that it was simply impossible for the die to fall other than it did under the same circumstances and at the same time 
given the same causes the same results will follow there is always a cause and a because to every event nothing ever happens without a cause or rather a chain of causes some confusion has arisen in the minds of persons considering this principle from the fact that they were unable to explain how one thing could cause another thing that is be the creator of the second thing as a matter of fact no thing ever causes or creates another thing cause and effect deals merely with events an event is that which comes arrives or happens as a result or consequence of some preceding event no event creates another event but is merely a preceding link in the great orderly chain of events flowing from the creative energy of the all there is a continuity between all events precedent consequent and subconsequent there is a relation existing between everything that has gone before and everything that follows a stone is dislodged from a mountain side and crashes through a roof of a cottage in the valley below at first sight we regard this as a chance effect but when we examine the matter we find a great chain of causes behind it in the first place there was the rain which softened the earth supporting the stone and which allowed it to fall then back of that was the influence of the sun other rains etc which gradually disintegrated the piece of rock from a larger piece then there were the causes which led to the formation of the mountain and its upheaval by convolutions of nature and so on ad infinitum then we might follow up the causes behind the rain etc then we might consider the existence of the roof in short we would soon find ourselves involved in a mesh of cause and effect from which we would soon strive to extricate ourselves just as a man has two parents and four grandparents and eight great-grandparents and sixteen great-great-grandparents and so on and so on until when say forty generations are calculated and the number of ancestors run into many millions so it is with the number of causes behind even the most trifling event or phenomena such as the passage of a tiny speck of soot before your eye it is not an easy matter to trace the bit of soot back to the early period of the world's history when it formed a part of a massive tree trunk which was afterward converted into coal and so on until the speck of soot now passes before your vision on its way to other adventures and a mighty chain of events causes and effects brought it to its present condition and the latter is but one of the chain of events which will go on to produce other events hundreds of years from now one of the series of events arising from the tiny bit of soot was the writing of these lines which caused the typesetter to perform certain work the proofreader to do likewise and which will arouse certain thoughts in your mind and that of others which will in turn affect others and so on and on and on beyond the ability of man to think further and all from the passage of a tiny bit of soot all of which shows the relativity and association of things and the further fact that there is no great there is no small in the mind that causeth all stop to think for a moment if a certain man had not met a certain maid away back in the dim period of the stone age you who are now reading these lines would not be here and if perhaps the same couple had failed to meet we who now write these lines would not be here and the very act of writing on our part and the act of reading on yours will affect not only the respective lives of yourself and ourselves but will have a direct or indirect effect upon many other people now living and who will live in the ages to come every thought we think every act we perform has its direct and indirect results which fit into the great chain of cause and effect we do not wish to enter into a consideration of free will or determination in this work for various reasons among the many reasons is the principal one that neither side of the controversy is entirely right in fact both sides are partially right according to the hermetic teachings the principle of polarity shows that both are but half-truths the opposing poles of truth the teachings are that a man may be both free and yet bound by necessity depending upon the meaning of the terms 
and the height of truth from which the matter is examined. The ancient writers express the matter thus. The further the creation is from the center, the more it is bound, the nearer the center it reaches, the nearer free is it. The majority of people are more or less the slaves of heredity, environment, etc., and manifest very little freedom. They are swayed by the opinions, customs, and thoughts of the outside world, and also by their emotions, feelings, moods, etc. They manifest no mastery worthy of the name. They indignantly repudiate this assertion, saying, Why, I am certainly free to act and do as I please. I do just what I want to do. But they fail to explain whence arise the want to and as I please. What makes them want to do one thing in preference to another? What makes them please to do this and not to do that? Is there no because to their pleasing and wanting? The master can change these pleases and wants into others at the opposite end of the mental pole. He is able to will to will instead of to will because some feeling, mood, emotion, or environmental suggestion arouses a tendency or desire with him to do so. The majority of people are carried along like the falling stone, obedient to environment, outside influences and internal moods, desires, etc., not to speak of the desires and wills of others stronger than themselves, heredity, environment, and suggestion, carrying them along without resistance on their part, or the exercise of the will. Moved like the pawns on the checkerboard of life, they play their parts and are laid aside after the game is over. But the masters, knowing the rules of the game, rise above the planes of material life, and place themselves in touch with the higher powers of their nature, dominate their own moods, characters, qualities, and polarity, as well as the environment surrounding them, and thus become movers in the game, instead of pawns, causes instead of effects. The masters do not escape the causation of the higher planes, but fall in with the higher laws, and thus master circumstances on the lower plane. They thus form a conscious part of the law, instead of being mere blind instruments. While they serve on the higher planes, they rule on the material plane. But on higher and on lower, the law is always in operation. There is no such thing as chance. The blind goddess has been abolished by reason. We are able to see now, with eyes made clear by knowledge, that everything is governed by universal law, that the infinite number of laws are but manifestations of the one great law, the law which is the all. It is true, indeed, that not a sparrow drops unnoticed by the mind of the all, and even the hairs on our head are numbered. As the scriptures have said, there is nothing outside the law, nothing that happens contrary to it. And yet, do not make the mistake of supposing that man is but a blind automation. Far from that. The hermetic teachings are that man may use law to overcome laws, and that the higher will always prevail against the lower, until at last he has reached the stage in which he seeks refuge in the law itself, and laughs the phenomenal laws to scorn. Are you able to grasp the inner meaning of this? End of chapter 12 Recording by Andrea Fiore